But anyway, good evening and welcome. And um, thank you everybody for joining us um, this evening. We're so pleased to welcome you to what is normally our Wednesday webinar, but is actually a Thursday webinar. So we always advertise our events as Wednesday webinars, but this um, this one actually happens to be on a Thursday. So it was just advertised as a, <laughs> as a Wednesday. So um, welcome, thank you for joining us. Um, this evening's webinar is The Art of FASD Advocacy. So communicating your child's needs effectively, strategies and tips for parents and caregivers, and how you can prepare mentally and emotionally for a meeting with professionals in all sectors which I guess is really crucial considering most of us have to deal with school, health and social care. And I'm delighted to welcome who I consider a really good friend because we met in person last year in Florida, mm -hmm. Michael Harris, um, who is a foster parent and a seasoned child psychologist specialising in guiding caregivers through the complexities of parenting. Um, I was lucky enough to do most of my FASD training with um, FASD Success and Jeff Noble and Michael Harris has been a coach on that programme. We met in person. I was immensely impressed and um, really loved his voice. I think that was the thing for me, this like calming voice really helped me as a caregiver and in my role with, within the hub. Um, one of my jobs is to, um, I suppose, secure people who are going to be able to come and do webinars for us and contribute to our community. So I guess most of it comes from what I have found beneficial, but also um, what I feel would be beneficial to our community being that we're on the other side of the world and how do things um, transition and what will we take from this and will it be beneficial that we live in a different sort of environment with different school processes and different social cares. But I think um, underlying all of that, communicating your child's needs effectively doesn't really matter where you live. You can live anywhere. You still have to communicate effectively and and also manage your own um, well-being and your own personality and your own family situation. So I'm really delighted to welcome Michael this evening. I'm going to hand over to him and I'm sure you'll have an absolutely wonderful hour. In the background will be myself and um, Barbara Ogston, who is the FASD um, services manager for the hub and the strategic lead for um, the whole of Adoption UK. So we will be monitoring the chat. Um, Michael hopefully will be able to answer any questions at the end if there becomes um, periods within the evening where we can ask questions, I'm sure we will. But for the time being, welcome, Michael. Thank you so much. And over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. I really appreciate that. And it was lovely to meet you in Florida last spring. Um, I have enjoyed my um uh, work with the FASD success and Jeff Noble and I've been a coach there um and before I totally get started I just want to make sure we have 60 minutes is that our normal time okay awesome um so I I really enjoy coaching and I'll do a little bit more of a, a introduction to myself in just a second but I'm, I'm a psychologist by trade and coaching is a little different than psych uh, than psychology and psychotherapy. Um, I do inform uh, both uh, or both inform what, what I do, but I've just, I've so enjoyed coaching. It's just, you can just, you can really get to the point faster, I think, because people are hungry and eager to work on that. And it's, it's more about what to do and or how to, it's really quick mind shift changes. So when Joe asked me about uh, the webinar that we could do and, and was talking about advocacy. I think that that's a really important topic because most of us are not trained as advocates. We don't really know what that is. There's not really a job description that I'm aware of. And so I think that 
by going through this, we've come up with some really good ideas. And I'm sure there's trainings about how to be an advocate and, and that sort of thing. But um, I really want to come at it from an FASD perspective and a mindset and sort of mental awareness, emotional fitness mindset, because the work that we do is very uh, taxing and very draining and unexpectedly so, right? It's just something could happen at any moment and we have to respond. So, so that's where I'll be coming from. And if folks have any questions, uh, just let uh, the drop that in the chat and we'll save a little time at the end. I do want to say that this is the first time I've given this presentation. It's brand new. Uh, so I'm still working on the timing and I will drop a link into the chat um, I think the chat and, or yeah, the webinar chat to get a handout later on. So I'll have, a, I'll, I'm working on a four or five page handout that kind of summarizes everything, but you're welcome to take notes and, but just know that you'll get some of that. It won't be the slides per se. And then um, hopefully here in the near future, I'll be coming out with a little handbook about this because it's just been so interesting uh, to get, to pull all this together. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen and get on with it. Share and just a quick check with Joe and Barbara if that is if we're back where we need to be. Okay, awesome. Okay, so um, the art of FAD FASD advocacy, a guide for caregivers, and I just like psychotherapy is an art, coaching is an art, parenting is an art, caregiving is an art. There are some strategies and research based kind of, uh, you know, guidelines and things that we can follow and learn from, but there's a lot, and there's a lot of, of what I would call like original teachings or, you know, teachings that have been around for a long time. Some need updating and don't work for today's world, but, th but they can evolve, but there's been a lot of um, tried and true methods that uh, work for parenting over the years that haven't been researched. However, a lot of those don't necessarily work with FASD, as you know, and that creates a lot of confusion and misperceptions and all these things that we're going to talk about today. So you can identify them when they're going on, when it's happening in a meeting, and then you can take steps to sort of reorient yourself or steady yourself or readjust the conversation, how that's going into a more productive way. So it is an art and it's not just, it's not necessarily uh, if this, then that. There's some of that and we want to give you a structure, but over time, as you do this, you can get better and better at it if you're able to stay grounded and sort of circle back and debrief with yourself and your peers and move on to a you know a higher plane of, uh, of doing this kind of work as you move along. So uh, we can't really improve without failure. None of us like failure, especially around caregiving. It doesn't have to be huge failures. Uh, when we're working with advocacy and explaining this to other folks, but just always kind of look at failure as an opportunity for learning. And I know it's easy to say that, uh, and it's much harder to execute on, but that's that's what we'll be uh, working on tonight. All right, let's see. So there's a picture of me when I was a little younger, not too much younger, uh, certainly happier. I just wanted in in my workplace, I work for the American Indian community. It's an urban community, so it's not really a tribal, uh, I mean, folks are from tribes, but they have come together in the Minneapolis, St. Paul, Twin Cities area. And so we kind of refer to the community as an urban American Indian community because there's so many tribes represented because people come as a melting pot here in some of the large cities. Uh, so I've I've lived in Minneapolis for 34 years, and uh, it's it got fashionable to say the land that you're on was unceded Dakota territory, uh, the land that we're on in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota right now. I originally grew up in the southern United States, and which is a fairly different atmosphere. And so I've got, you know, lots of different viewpoints and things that I've had to integrate over the years. Worked at the Indian Health Board is what it's called since 1975. I've been a licensed psychologist since 97. And here's where the interesting part is. I've been a foster dad of a single kid who uh, arrived in my family at age 14 in 2012. So he is about to turn 26 
and 27, geez. And um, th that I'm coming to you from that perspective today as a parent, but I also have done a lot of work since 1997 in fetal alcohol spectrum to sort of done uh, assessments and interventions and workshops and trainings and written things and blogs and podcasts and all of that. Uh, and those are just some of the, the FASD elephant and some of that. Those are some of the projects that I've developed over the years. And now I like to do the training and coaching and consulting. I've been doing that actually almost since I started this too, but I am showing up as a caregiver today. So uh, I just want you to know where I'm coming from. That is a picture of me and my uh, foster son who he had turned 18 and we went to a barbecue. So I would encourage you to uh, Google barbecue. Uh, I, I had never um, experienced anything like that in my life with a with a band named Guar, uh, which is a little bit like uh, the musical group Kiss, but with a lot of sass and craziness. So uh, once I understood what they were doing, I, I just thought they were hilarious, but I would never have been attracted to that at all. And they had an annual event that he had always wanted to go to since he was 14. And we finally went when he was 18 in the sort of eastern part of the United States. And uh, it was it was quite fun. We took a train and flew back and we just we had so much fun. He'd never done anything like that. And he turned 18. So I bought some cigars. And there's a funny picture of us. Um, this kid has taught me so much. He's he's made me into a better person. And I just want to give the, you know, honor to him. And, and just I'm, I'm always grateful for that. And it has been hard <laughs> and uh, sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's good. And like I said, he's 26, almost 27 now. Things have really improved. And a lot of a lot of the things that I'm peppering the talk today will uh, are, are things that I have learned uh, just from repetition with him. So I'm going to move on to this uh, slide right here, effective communication. That was my introduction. So part two here is about effective communication about FASD with professionals. And I was, so the graphics that I use just maybe don't pay attention to those quite so much. I was fooling around with some artificial intelligence to make graphics and they, they had not always hit or miss. And I thought I'd focus on the, on the content uh, first and foremost, but the importance of understanding and addressing these common misperceptions about FASD and I, when I think of the professional setting, I think of most mostly it comes down to educational and healthcare environments, but it can also be legal environments or um, with the uh, police. And, you know, there's just there's lots of places that this can show up. Sometimes I think of this as the grocery store. We might even have to advocate at the grocery store or the market. But um, the knowledge that we are looking at and and learning as caregivers, it's hard to translate that to other folks. And it's also hard to translate that to other, uh, to professionals, even though it would seem like they would know what they're doing and what they're talking about. Um, let me move forward here. Is it, okay, so I wanna talk about four strategies for handling common FASD misunderstandings. So imagine that you are in a school meeting and you're trying to explain what you need or would like from the school and they want to be helpful, but they might be feeling frustrated and they might be feeling like uh, they're, they're blaming your student or they're blaming you for being a bad parent, or you're certainly might be feeling like you're being a uh, not that great of a parent. And um, there are some things that can be said or that they would say, I guess, during a meeting or a phone call or even an email, I suppose. And I, I want to point out three in particular so you can be watching for these. So as you're watching for these three kinds of um, comments or commentary or reflections back or assertions even that professionals or other folks would say, um, th this is how you can start noticing and becoming aware that this is going on, right? Because you might hear something and then you have a negative reaction or a defensive reaction or a protective uh, reaction. And what, what is actually happening is 
there's one of these three, and there, and there might be others, but these are, you know, three uh, large categories um, that might be going on. So if you're able to recognize and name something, if you're having a feeling during a meeting or when someone is not working with you in the way that you would like with your uh, son or daughter or other with uh, with FASD, then it might come down to one of these, all right? So the first is identifying and addressing dismissals. And when we're in meetings or conversations, there is often a lot of dismissive language, right? Language that is not really taking into account what you're saying. And, or your concerns or the facts or examples that you're bringing to the table to talk about are, or your insights even, or your gut feelings as a, as a caregiver, those are not being properly attended to or given the weight and, and perhaps even, and probably even dismissed. Like, well, you're the parent, you don't really understand this. And then I, I would like to know if people want to drop in the chat, you can say, what, what do you like to do when you're feeling dismissed, right? Um, if, you have some, if you have some idea of strategies, you can drop that in there. But I think when you're, when you're being dismissed, one of the best strategies is to notice that, right? So if you think of an example of a time when you were feeling dismissed or someone in the meeting, a professional or someone in a power uh, dynamic was... Uh, being dismissive or having a dismissive attitude toward you, what did you notice? What did you notice going on in your body, right? Not necessarily what they said, although that's important, but what did you notice in your body? And I want you to start thinking about how you can get a connection between your bodily sensations and reactions, those emotional reactions like anger or anxiety or shutdown or whatever that you might be feeling want you to start being able to make a link between that and what's going on. So when you feel one of those feelings, you can say, oh, I'm, I'm feeling uh, shut down. I, therefore, one of the things that they might be doing is dismiss, having a dismissive attitude, right? So you can start, what, I, what I'm advocating for you to do is to start actively in a meeting, being able to identify what's actually going on instead of the... Uh, instead of the professionals or the team being sort of a jerk or not listening, like what, what do you experience and how can you use that as a signal to say, wait, wait, I'm being dismissed. And then you can figure out what to do, right? So it brings you grounded and present into reality, right? So some people express frustration and I would say frustration is a, is a great example. And how do you know you're frustrated? That's what I would ask you. What are the sensations or feelings in like physical feelings that you have when you're feeling frustrated, right? And so uh, Catherine put breathing stops for a second right there. Breathing stops. It's like, you're, it's almost like you're feeling like you're prey uh, or like, you know, they're about to attack you because here they are dismissing you. And the next thing is an attack. And what happens is that they could be having a, um, you might be having probably what you're having is a fight or flight sort of, uh, survival instinct response, right? Because you're trying to protect your, your student, your child with FASD and here now you're having to either shut down or brace for some kind of attack that might happen, Right. So heart beats faster. Exactly. Those are, we want to look at some of the physical things, not just the thoughts or conceptual uh, component of, about them, right? Now, uh, the other kind of uh, sort of statement or assertions that you might hear in a meeting are misattributions. And I used to like to talk to, about misattributions a lot. I have this program called the FASD Elephant, and it's about... Um, thinking one thing is happening, but it's really something else, right? So a, a misattribution is is frankly just when you get the, um, sorry, is when, is when you get the, you identify something as the cause of a behavior or symptom. We'll start calling these symptoms in, in just a minute, but it's not really the reason that the behavior or symptom is, is happening, right? So a misattribution is when someone says th th these are the kind these are the kinds of things that 
perceptions, misperceptions, I guess would be another uh, synonym for that, for the misattribution is they're attributing the behavior to something about the kid instead of the brain. They're attributing something about the behavior or outcome to the kid's willfulness or the kid's ability rather than the kid's neuro uh, atypical condition, right? So I hope that's making sense. And if anybody has recently experienced a misattribution, uh, you're welcome to also throw that into the chat as just a, a couple of discussion points. But it will often be something about, you know, you might be saying, well, I think that's the FASD because the auditory processing is very slow for my child. And they're like, mm, I think they're not listening because they don't want to listen, right? Not because the auditory processing is slower or takes more time, right? So that would be a misattribution. The professional, and non-professionals do this too, right? But the professional is attributing the cause or is attributing the behavior to a cause that's not really the cause, right? And I think the way to start talking about that is that you you always want to bring it back to the FASD and the neuroatypical condition that the kid has um, and say, well, you know, it's, I, it's not that per se, it's the bigger picture. And that relates back, like not seeing the bigger picture is a very uh, common thing. And we're just, we're all trapped by our training and our experiences. And I used to have this program, like I had said, called the FASD elephant. And it's not about the whole, you know, eating an elephant one bite at a time. A lot of people think that it's, it's based on the story where there were five people who could not see and they each were asked to touch a part of an elephant and explain what an elephant is, right? And maybe you've heard this story. One would one touched the tusk and said, oh, an elephant is like a spear. Uh, one touched the elephant's ear and said, oh, an elephant is like a big fan. One touched the leg and felt the leg. And, it's, and that person said, oh, the elephant is like a tree. And another one touched the tail and thought the elephant was more like a snake or a rope. And so you can see like each per they were all kind of right, but they were wrong because they didn't have the full picture of what an elephant is. And that's what happens to us as professionals and us as parents, right? We start seeing things or can only see things at first from where our training came from or where our belief system and opinion and knowledge base uh, comes from. So a doctor might see uh, ADHD, right? A teacher might see learning disabilities. And an OT, who I would probably trust the OT's opinions more than almost anybody's, right? But the OT would see sensory issues, sensory integration issues. Another parent at the store might see a bad kid or a bad parent, right? So those, they're all making... It's, it's not an unreasonable, crazy assumption that they're making, but it's a misattribution because it's not connecting in the right way or in the correct way. Um, then the, the third part is about challenging expert misconceptions. And uh, I think that can be kind of scary. And that is... Um, and I know, so, like, I have had to do this personally, and but I've, I also know a lot of the folks that we coach. They've had they've had to do this, and uh, an expert miscon sorry, an expert misconception is a condition where the uh, the expert, the doctor or teacher or whoever, is either misinformed about F FASD, or they don't think it's as all encompassing as it is, or they they miss some mark about it, or, or they think that someone will grow out of it because they have other um, examples of when the kid performed well at one point, but they're not at another. Now, I, I got to say, one of, one of the strategies to address this kind of thing would be to foster a relationship between yourself and the uh, professional. And in some cases, that's that's very hard to do. But um, the, the, the challenge that they give us is that it 
it can produce that reaction like I'm talking about again, right? The heart beating faster, the slow breathing or holding the breath, a withdrawal, shutdown, all of those kinds of things. So that's another uh, uh, component of when an FASD misunderstanding uh, can be going on. Now, the fourth one is uh, leveraging collective wisdom. And this is this is more of a, I guess, a solution for yourself on on this. And th this is why groups like uh, this uh, on this webinar and some of the coaching groups that I'm involved in and even online support groups. And uh, especially early on when I was a foster parent, I went to a lot of support groups and they were very helpful. And, and it's about leveraging that collective wisdom because somebody else almost certainly has been in your place or will be in your place. And so it's this collection of uh, experiences that are helpful and supportive and you can see what other people have done. You can share what you've done so that the, those that who, whose kids are soon to be in this situation, they can, uh, they can become knowledgeable about what to do and, and learn from your experiences and quote, quote, mistakes, right? Um, it also, and later on, we'll talk a little bit about the um, rehearsing strategies and things like that. This is, the, a group like that is also really good to rehearse what you're going to say. You just like get some major points. You don't have to actually pretend like you're giving the speech, right? But you can... Um, you can rehearse the points and, and other people will say, oh, don't forget to say this or don't get to add this in. So those are those are other ways. And then also they can be helpful when there is, excuse me, when there is an FASD understanding because then they probably had to re-explain this in another way themselves so they can provide support that way. All right, I'm gonna move on to some effective advocacy language. Language can be so important about how we phrase things, um, and not only to professionals, but also to our kids, right? We have to make sure that we are um, precise sometimes so that we're at least using the right definition. Let's see, I had an ambulance going by. Um, so it's important to know the language and, and reframe things. And here's the point of this one, right? We want to re reframe FASD from a behavioral issue, right, to a neurodevelopmental condition, that neuroatypicality, because the end game here is to start talking about not behaviors, but behaviors as symptoms. The behaviors are the symptoms, rather than um, the, ch the child is not the problem per se. The behaviors are symptoms of the problem of FASD, right? And that can start getting the conversation moved into focusing on a different kind of intervention. Because if you feel, of course, that the child is at, at issue and being willful, then somebody's going to want to pull out a sticker chart uh, to do that or some kind of positive reinforcement, which I think most of us can agree that mostly doesn't work, uh, mostly doesn't work for uh, a lot of our kids. Okay. Tracy says the word expert. Yes. Okay. So the idea is that I don't like the word expert. Right. Um, and I, I guess, so I'm going to rethink about how I'm using the word expert in this uh, conversation uh, about advocacy. So thank you for that. Um, that'll just help make it better for next time. But I do, I do think that people think of themselves as experts, right? And that, so it, it puts them on a place where they feel like they have to say something, right? And that's where these misconceptions and things uh, come out. And, and it can also, like you're saying, create that condition where they're not willing to learn. So I really appreciate that comment, Tracy. Um, and I will incorporate that in as I, as I redevelop this uh, talk. But yeah, you're right. You're right. Even if as we come in thinking about them as experts rather than partners, then we may we may get further along if we think of them as partners and help them see us as partners as well. Uh, right, so there we go. Language, languaging right there. That, that's, that's how important language is because it brings a lot of things with it depending on the words that we use. Okay, so here are some key phrases 
for languaging that might be helpful. And again, if people see uh, worries about using some of this language, please drop that into the chat. I would love to know about that because I, like I said, first time, uh, but I want to make sure it's, I think it's the concepts that I'm uh, that bringing forward that'll be helpful, but we want to get the language right too. Uh, so the, one of the key phrases that you want to be using and thinking about a lot is FASD is a brain-based neurodevelopmental condition, not a behavioral choice, right? Now we know that, and that's a little bit of a mouthful. So we might want to pare that down and get it into a shorter way, but essentially we always want to bring it back to the brain, right? Back to the brain, back to the neurodevelopmental condition, back to the neuroatypicality. Uh, sometimes I like to make quick comparisons to autism when I'm explaining this to a, another person, right? Because that there's just so much um, literature and awareness about autism, and it's sort of in the same vein in the terms of understanding. So if people can make that as a bridge to get that same kind of understanding, uh, that it's not it's not the person, it's not a behavioral choice, it's what the brain is calling them to do. But this cues folks to conceptualize actions less as willful behavior and more symptoms of the condition, right? I'm going to speed up just a little bit. See, we're halfway through. Uh, here's another key phrase that you can use when you're talking to professionals. Uh, and you can change these into your own uh, wording that is comfortable for you. But let's consider how my child's brain processes this situation differently. Right? That, encourage, that encourages that shift from blaming uh, and into understanding, right? understanding the brain functioning. And you wanna really move the conversation to be talking about your kid's unique neurology, your, your kid's unique needs. You don't even have to say the word neurology. What do they need and how are we gonna find out what they need? Because sometimes, oftentimes they don't know, my son didn't, right? And we would have to do a little bit of experimenting or try to engage and try try things out. But it's, it's um, it's definitely one of those situations that if you think about like, my kid is seeing this differently. And here's a really quick example. My son and I got into a little bit of an argument uh, last week, a week from today. And he he misperceived. And from his, from his point of view, I misspoke, right? He felt that I was trying to tell him what to do on something. And I was just saying, oh, if you do that, particular course of action, here's what will probably happen, right? He was trying to cancel his cable bill. And he's like, okay, I'll do fine. I'll do it your way. And he just got more and more angry as I was trying to explain to him that um, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. And that just made him more angry, right? So his his brain was processing this very differently than even what how I was trying to make it come out of my mouth. And I was trying to be very, you know, open-minded and calm about this uh, so it can just, it can happen to the, to the, I was going to say it can happen to the best of us. It can happen to any of us. Right. Uh, but uh, it's, it's very important to go back to the, how the brain is functioning. And that's what I kept thinking about while I was talking to him. Okay. He's, he's hearing this differently than what I mean. We're having a failure to communicate <laughs> as it were. Here's a third phrase uh, that you can use in advocacy meetings. And when you're talking about your child, while my child may show ability at times, the consistency of their capability is affected by FASD, which impacts their brain function, which impacts their behavioral functioning, right? So as I was writing this up, it really, I really wanted to draw the distinction between a lot of folks see your kid do something well once or twice or under certain conditions and not ever again or not un under most conditions. And so, so for instance, they sure can't pay attention on the, on the games, right? On the online games, but they can't pay attention on, you know, whatever that is boring and not designed to be addictive, right? So we want to move the conversation from ability to capability or even capacity is another, is another way to think about that. And it just, it just starts highlighting that difference between the, it's not a behavior, it's a symptom. Think of it as a symptom. This is all symptoms. Okay, key phrase number four that you can use 
what accommodations can we create that acknowledge my child's brain differences? And this is a good one to uh, bring up if if someone has suggested like some kind of positive reinforcement, like a sticker chart, you know, or earning stars or, or earning points or, you know, all these kind of earning earning uh, programs, they're not without, I mean, they sometimes they have some utility, but mostly they're not helpful with our kids. You want to move the discussion to like, not what some standard practice or common intervention that works with uh, neurotypical kids. What is something that we need to find that's specific to my kid? And it does take a lot of creativity and problem solving, and it may work for a week or two and then quit working or a day or two and quit working. That is the nature of the FASD, right? Um, a final phrase here. Remember, our true goal is to find solutions that build on my child's strengths and accommodate the neuroatypicality. So uh, sometimes in meetings that I've been in and heard about, is that people start getting into the weeds and getting into these really specific issues and it, they start losing track of what's the true goal, right? So I think it's always okay to take a pause in the meeting. And you as a caregiver are certainly able to do that. And like, what are we really trying to accomplish here? What are we, and, that, and that's not even just if you're trying to find a, an intervention for your child, but like, what are we really trying to accomplish? We're trying to get an IEP or um, educational plan. We call them IEPs in the US. We're trying to get an educational plan that works for my kid. We're not trying to get five uh, interventions. We just we might just need one, or we might need the one to be very flexible. How, what are we gonna do for my kid in this situation, right? That's our true goal. We're not trying to figure out is, three prompts better than four prompts or something. Those specifics uh, will, will come as we are working on them. Okay, a uh, few more languaging tips here. And I'll just, again, I'm gonna speed this up just a little bit. Um, ECHP in England, Educational Health Planning, thank you. Yep, uh, so for some phrasing tips, use specific examples when you're talking about your kid. Uh, specific examples of where the neuroatypicality affected their learning or their behavior. Just concrete example, right? Concrete examples help for all of us. Uh, and then if you have an example of, of some learning difference that you can really draw attention to and use an example uh, during a meeting or when, when discussing with a doctor or a, an educational professional, that can be super helpful. Uh, the second tip is emphasizing strengths and interests. I, I think the longer that I've done this, and I, by now I've done this a lot of years, the, the strength-based approach, there's, there's two components here. Strength-based approach and the relationship approach are going to get you further than almost any other approach. All right. Strengths based, looking for the strengths and interests of, and building on those of what the child has and focusing on the relationship. All right. Um, and again, it's 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 moving the conversation away from a deficit model to a strengths based model, what the kid can do with accommodations and support versus what they're not doing. Right. Routine and consistency. Absolutely. Uh, avoid medical jargon. Um, you know, even with professionals, some it, sometimes people will use jargon, and they may it may mean something different to someone else, right? You would think like ADHD means something this, this, and this, and it does have a very specific definition. If you go back to the ICD-10, the diagnostic codes, and that's really what ADHD is, um, according to those uh, to that diagnostic code. But as we talk about it, we may use it you know, to mean attention problems or hyperactivity or something. So it's just, it's better to be descriptive, I guess. Clear language that is describing what's going on. And also because you might say ADHD and the, and, uh, the doctor might hear it one way, the teacher might hear it another way, and you might be meaning it a, a somewhat different way. And so we're not really on the same page. 
So describe what's going on. Avoid that medical jargon. And there are some some cases, and and it's okay if some if a teacher or a doctor uses jargon, whether it's educational jargon or whatever. It's okay to say, you know what? Can you just define that for me so we, I can make sure that we're all on the same page, that we all all have that same understanding. All right, and then finally, I, I won't spend too much time on this because I definitely want to get to the to some of the. Uh, emotional fitness exercises, but reframe challenges as opportunities. One of the things that I like to do is uh, talk, ask myself, this is one of the hardest things to do, but say, how is this happening for me, not to me, right? How is this happening for me, not to me? If this hard meeting or this frustrating meeting or angering meeting is happening to me, what what is that doing for me? If this is powering me up for more uh, advocacy. It's powering me up to go up to the next level, up the hierarchy of, of the system or something like that. So it's it's hard to do, but I just want to throw it in, reframe challenges as opportunities. And that's what we can do with our kids as well. Um, it's an opportunity to learn more about the kid. And I've, I've kind of been practice what I preach here with my own son. And uh, it's it's exhausting, I will say that. So I, I want you to know I'm not just saying you should be doing all this stuff. We do eat the elephant a bite at a time, uh, but um, um, it's exhausting, but but we can do this in small steps. Just a few more on this advocacy. Of course, meeting and phone contact, tips for advocacy. Cre either know what the agenda is for a meeting or create your own agenda or come with an agenda or a list of items that you want to talk about. Uh, and make sure that are covered in any meeting. You might want to have those key phrases that you want to have. Uh, you want want to have a little reminder to, uh, like I start not breathing, or I start holding my breath when I'm feeling dismissed or contradicted in a way that's not helpful. And then in groups such as this or with other caregivers, you can either role play or just kind of, you know, say, I want to go over this conversation. I want to hit this point, this point, this point, what do folks think, right? So that can be some of the preparation in the meeting. It's never a bad idea to say, you know, we're all here for the kid. We're all here for this goal of making uh, my son or daughter successful as much as possible. And I've also got there use PQ reps, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. And then any kind of follow up after the meeting, it's all, never a bad idea. And I know this is not that easy to do sometimes because we're harried and busy, and we got to get to the next thing. But just provide an email summary, or you know, some kind of summary about your understanding of what the everyone was the gist of the conversation that you were having in the meeting. Um, any key decisions, you want to jot those down, any deadlines associated with those decisions, or if the school or someone said, I'm going to do this by this, then you've got that in writing. And I would also put down the list of things not yet resolved. And even if they didn't want to resolve them, you still, I've still got a question about this. We got to cover this and we got to do something about this. Make sure that you stay organized. Again, easier said than done, but make sure that you keep some kind of tracking about that um, so that you can stay on top of it. And this just uh, by and by sending this out to the participants in the meeting, or at least the team leader, whoever was calling the meeting, it just it it ensures that everybody's on the same page and that everybody can keep on moving forward. All right. Uh, okay. So th this is some of my um, favorite part: is the mental and emotional preparedness and the fitness skills. Right. They seem secondary, but this is really the gist of what I want to focus on is what are some of the basics, the basic skills that we need to have in place and to practice over time in order to be uh, a proper advocate and an effective advocate for our, um, our, our child, right? So uh, first one is just, oops, did I press the wrong one? I think I pressed the wrong button. Sorry. There we go. Uh, here, here's, here's. Oh, I'm sorry. This uh, this slide was out of place. Sorry. First time. First time. Okay. Um, another way to another way to support your uh, advocacy is to craft and tell a story about your child. Right. 
and sometimes it's it's overwhelming to have um, so many facts and so many problems and have all of that. And if you if you are able to share a story about a success or a hard time that your child had, right, that can go a long ways in illustrating what the problems are, right? It's almost like the show don't tell, even though you're telling in the story. Um, it's you're you're showing the big picture by telling a story about your kid. And there's there's uh, specific ways to sort of craft a narrative like that. Uh, and I won't stay on this one long, but I just, I thought it was important to say, you wanna begin with what they call begin with the heart. It's what is important to your kid, what's important to you, what is unique and special about your kid, what are their, even like their hobbies and their interests and what are they good at? You want to really start with that, um, that kind of starting point. Then it's, I think the next part, because you want to start with the positive, right? And then the next part is you start with the, you, then you move on and express what the, some challenges are and how these challenges affect daily life, right? Then that sets you up to talk about the needs that your child has be during a conversation right the the needs that your child has and then end end your comments with something hopeful right like he's worked hard at this or she is really wanting to try this and is very hopeful about it something that is uh leaves leaves things on a hopeful note and hope can go a long ways i put that there uh i read somewhere i don't know if this is true but it sounds right like hope uh, a hopeful, optimistic attitude. If a person who is just sort of genuinely having that over time, they actually have a longer lifespan of like two years or five years or something. Um, I need to follow that up, but um, it sounded right. So I'll go with it. Okay. Next slide. More emotional fitness skills. Positive intelligence quotient. Okay. So this is what I would like to focus on for the rest of the time here. And positive intelligence is a concept that was uh, developed by a man named Shirzad Shamin. And he uh, drew together pos this positive psychology and cognitive psychology, lots of different um, sort of um, psychology thoughts about being your best self, right? And he put this together and, and actually used research to inform it. He hasn't researched this program, but he used research findings to develop his uh, approach. And essentially what a what a positive intelligence is a whole sort of operating system, the way that you think and operate in the world uh, that you can use. But I wanna talk about PQ reps. So, and that stands for positive intelligence quotient, like a intelligence quotient or emotional quotient, the EQ and the IQ, this is a PQ, your positive intelligence quotient. And essentially what they are, are they're brief sensory-based exercises that boost your ability to maintain your focus, manage stress, and stay present. They, and I've been using these for four or five years, and I use them frequently in coaching and recommend them in coaching. Um, and you'll, you'll see that they're very easy to do, and they're a, they're a form of kind of taking care of yourself beforehand and you can also the great thing about them is you can use them in the moment during a stressful situation um, and it's important to practice over time it's a little bit like working out at the gym working out one or two times is good but it's not going to give you the long lasting results that you need or that you could benefit from more if you had uh, had more of this so i want to i want to talk about the pq reps how they work and then we can try one out here for a second. Uh, essentially, what you do is you focus very intensely on one of your five senses. Now, it's usually easier to just choose physical sensation. And what I recommend for people is to put the, their thumb and their fingertip, their forefinger together, like you're making an OK sign, and rub. And go ahead and try this if you're comfortable doing that. Rub your forefinger and your thumb together with such, and noticing it with such intensity that you can feel the ridges 
of your thumb and forefinger, like you can feel those ridges. And just put your focus all on that. Right? Your full attention. Notice every detail. You can put all five fingers together, uh, both hands and rub them together. And just notice in your palms, put your palms like you're almost, you know, have a hands together and move them around. Feel the sensations of your hands. pressure, the temperature, are your hands clammy? Are they cold? Are they dry? Are they warm? All that texture. As you're doing that, keep on doing that for a few more seconds, but as you're doing that, your mind will want to wander and that's okay. And when it does start thinking about something else, you go back to the sensation, right? So the PQ rep is keeping your awareness on the sensation rather than on any thought. So, and meditation would be a form of PQ rep, incidentally. So you don't have to meditate. We don't have to sit around for 20 minutes or, you know, all day and meditate. These PQ reps are helpful if, and you can do them for about 60 seconds, right? One minute, maybe two minutes. If you do four or five a day, it's just spread them out to the day. What happens is it strengthens what Shirzad calls your sage mind. Other traditions have called it your wise mind or your higher self or your, um, you know, connecting to your higher power even. And if you've, if you've done, if you tried that, I would like for people to put in the chat if you've noticed any change, because what happens is, let me change the next slide. Any changes that you felt, and if you didn't feel any change, that's okay, because it, it takes, sometimes it can take time to get these uh, working. It's like building that muscle, right? The one time may or may not do anything, but it it moves you. It can help move you into a more down-regulated state and take you out of your uh, sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight or flight system and that survival system, into the uh, prefrontal cortex and the in the parasympathetic nervous system, which is where we are able to make our good decisions, right? It over time, these PQ reps can reduce your stress, they can enhance your focus, and it builds mental resilience over time. Um, I have done these sitting in the dentist office, even because I'll be sitting sitting in the chair waiting for the dentist to come and I'll notice myself, I'm bracing, right? I'm just bracing. There is not, there's, the dentist isn't even in the office yet or in the room yet. Um, and I notice myself as bracing because, you know, I feel like there's about to be a, a, a on survival mode, there's about to be an attack on my mouth, right? And so I'll do these PQ reps in the dent dentist office. I'll do these PQ reps um, while I'm talking to my son. I'll do these PQ reps before I give this presentation to make sure I'm in a, a well-regulated state. And it doesn't just have to be that physical sensation. So it can be auditory. You can listen to uh, music very intently and pick out the melody or pick out a particular instrument. Um, just that total immersion, which is also called a flow state. It's, it, would want, it would be something that would get you into a state of flow. Um, and that down-regulates your nervous system. It builds that mental muscle. And over time, you can get calmer, and better regulated more quickly if you do these over and over. These are the perfect exercise to do if you have a lot of advocacy to do with your child, all right? And here, just a really quick one, incorporate PQ reps into your life, a daily practice. You can do them before meetings. You can do them as a reset, uh, either during or after, or before a planned stressful moment, right? You just equip yourself with maintaining that balance. And again, it's not that you're you're never going to lose your cool or never going to feel a certain way. Um, it's that we are going to build our muscle to get back to ready faster, right? Yes. So if there's any questions, go ahead. It's, um, yep, we're running close to the hour, right? And then uh, I just want to say one final thing about self-care for caregivers or how to take a quick soak for your soul in three minutes or less. less. Um, self-care is so critical. And those PQ reps, that's self-care. Taking the breath, that's self-care. 
taken a, taking a quick walk around the block, that is self-care. Um, finding a moment of peace to yourself, that is self-care. Drinking some warm uh, tea or hot tea or something, that is taking care of yourself. Those are all self-care things. It's not, I like to tease people, we don't have time for bubble baths. Uh, as parents of uh, and caregivers of FASD children, but uh, we can take those small moments, and that's why PQ reps are just the perfect, perfect thing for us. All right, so I see we've got three more minutes. I'm going to go ahead and jump to the last slide uh, that has some staying in touch, and I'll, I'll drop that in the. I will drop that into the chat for everyone. And I sure do appreciate everybody. I'm going to, I'm not sure I can get it without losing my spot. <laughs> yep. And so Susan says useless at those types of things. Yep. Yep. No, I hear you. And um, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. Yep. Uh, I hear you. And if if nothing else, just rub your fingers together, right? There's nothing stopping you from doing that. Or, or if there if there is, I can find a different uh, avenue to do the PQ reps for you. But um, I do this. Just yeah. I and, well, and I do this. I do it that way because I um I don't get much from this that way, but I do get. I I don't know what I get from that, but I can. I don't know what I get really. I it's the Good tips voice. of my fingers. Yep. Like I never I have to say, Michael, I didn't believe in this stuff. <laughs> I know. I remember you saying that. Yeah. I just remember I just did not believe in it anyway. But um I I do it because um because I'm a bit of a like show busy, freaky, like fly off the seat of my pants type of person. So I needed to calm myself to be like advocating all the time but not having confrontation I think for me that was a really big thing because I was very I was very driven about advocating for my daughter but sometimes I think my drive was just too attacking to and so everybody was on the back foot so I needed to address my own way of advocating to have people on my side which meant I needed to really not change my personality, but just change uh, my my persona. So, like, I was angry, but I needed to find a different way to channel my anger. So I yeah. did. I do do this, yeah. and it's really funny because I can't actually tell anybody who's here what it does, except that I can feel things on my I can feel lines on my fingers that I can't see and it just yeah. has this bizarre thing I'll sit there and just go da, 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 da. okay <laughs> and yeah. I don't I, I can't explain it I'm not I'm not I don't have a professional qualification I'm just mum um but I I I do I do use that and I can't do it like the bizarre thing is I can't feel the same if I do it like that. I can only feel it if I do it like that. Well, and, and, you know, I would just so it like people got to find what works for them, but it's whatever intense focus on any sense, one of the five senses that will work. So some people will touch their cheeks, right? Yeah, like that. Or, or even, or they'll feel the breath coming in and out of their nose, or they'll feel their, the seat of their pants sitting on the chair, right? Or, and I really do like, and Susan was saying maybe the music. Yeah, so listen to the music and pick out pick out the cello or pick out the vocal or pick, you know, be very intensely uh, uh, focused on that. If you're eating, taste the garlic, taste the whatever the spice or the, you know, the flavoring you can, you and the smell, you can do this with lavender or essential oils or the smell of coffee or tea or something. There are so many ways you can do this intensely. So there's that, let's see this side, you see that design in the back of behind me, um, someone who might be more visual, they might prefer to like really, really focus on that pattern and try to figure that out. Right. Yeah. So that pattern and, and without thinking about it. Right. So just notice all the patterning about it. Now it happens to be a 
a Dakota deco art style blend by one of our local artists here in Minnesota, right? But just noticing that pattern over and over and like, oh, look, there's green. There's, uh, uh, uh. And I'm like, I even have like um, a lavender spray that um, I have to spray on my pillow and my quilt when I go to bed because most times I go to bed, my brain kicks into like um, all the things that I need to still address that I, because it just seems this like never ending advocacy parental thing alongside your work and your normal life. So I have this thing and I, and I spray it on the, on my husband's side of the bed. And I think he just gets into bed and thinks, what was that? No, but for me, sure. it just, no. I actually, what I find is I do, I really struggle with sleep. So with the lavender, I fall asleep. I don't sleep well, but I do fall asleep. I'm still up really early, but I at least, at least get like five or six hours sleep and then I'm awake. So um, Monica's just said, can we get a copy of the strategy statement to use at meetings? And I know you said you were um, looking at doing a handbook, but I think those, you know, those like each slide where it said, say this, say that, is yes, that going to yeah. be in your handbook? Because I think that's really useful for parents to have like, words because yeah. when you go into a meeting yes. it's it's very hard when you're faced with professionals often two or three at one time and if you've just got like stock things I mean my my daughter's last EHCP I took another parent caregiver with me who has an individual mm -hmm. her son's but he's a lot older so I took her with me and um she just kept like feeding pieces of paper across me to remind me what to say because yeah. she so you feel a bit pinned back because yes. they they come back quite quick about, well, it's fine. They're normal. They can do this. And you're like, no, 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 no. But and because of, you know, a lot of us face masking and that type of things with our children, it's, it's really difficult mm -hmm. because the school will say, well, they're absolutely fine. And then when they come home, what they're seeing in school is very, very different to what comes through our doors at the end of the yes. night. Um so I think those key phrases that were on your slides would be absolutely perfect if we, if we can get those handbooks. Uh, yes. So I put the link in there and it's a it's a little splash page. It's actually so I've actually got an FASD uh, sort of meditation daily devotion book I'm working on. Uh, but I know everybody who signs up today who, who trades their email for me, I will send them the handout for today, which will include those slides. It'll include those phrasings and stuff. I'll leave out some of the dry stuff, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> right. And put, I'll put the, I'll make it very useful for folks. Um, if you'll be kind enough to sign up on that webpage and then I'll just have everybody on one spot. So, and it's fine. It's, it's fine. And I know it says nothing about the um, uh, advocacy on that page, but I will, I will know everybody who signs up in the next hour or whatever. Um, that, it, that that's what they will want. So. Fabulous. Well, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. I know we've taken up a little bit more of your time than planned, but thank you so much for being with us this evening. Thank you, everybody who's joined us this evening. Please, um, oh, thank you, Monica. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> um, I'm so glad that you've enjoyed this evening. I hope you'll go to bed a little bit more relaxed having um, listened to Michael for an hour, because I will. Um, <laughs> and you can do and, repeat two reps. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll just go to bed like that. And you're going to sleep, yes. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do, because I've got like very few stressful days coming up. But um, yeah. thank you so much. Um, definitely sign up. Um, take care. We'll see you at our next webinar. Thank you for joining yeah. us. And good night. God bless. Good night, bye -bye. everybody. Bye -bye.